you join me today at the wheel of Volkswagen's big family car from the late 90s into the early noughties. Yes, I'm driving a B5 VW Passat. And it's got a two litre petrol in it. That's a bit weird. Hello, welcome to Furious Driving and back to the 1990s when fleet cars and company cars ruled the roads and the Mondeo was king of the car park. But the Mondeo didn't have it all to itself because there were other contenders from all different sides. But if you were looking for that perceived quality angle, then you would probably have headed straight for your local Volkswagen dealer and found this, the B5 Passat. Now back at that time in the 90s, the saloon, which is of course the best shape of car, was still very much ruling the roost in terms of sales. And these things do look very elegant, very dignified. They've got a very grown up feel and look when you approach a saloon car, much more than a blobby SUV thing. Maybe they look a little old fashioned these days, but they look dignified in a way that an SUV never can. Anyway. The B5 generation of Passat was launched in 1996 on continental Europe. It came to the UK in February 97 and to America in 1998. And this round, very smooth, integrated styling comes from the Concept One concept car, which grew into the Beetle originally, and then translated to the rest of the Volkswagen range. It's perhaps not the most visually exciting of styles, but it is very, very, well, as integrated is the only word I can really think of. It's just very round, very smooth. It's actually quite minimalist. It's lack of detail provides detail. Does that sound like a design language kind of thing to say? Now the car was facelifted in 2001. This is a 2001 on a Y plate. So it got the benefit of the new sparkly grill and the projector headlights and the new even smoother bumpers. Similar stuff went on around the back as well. And here's some of that perceived quality going on with a big hydraulic strut to open the bonnet. Now under the bonnet on this particular car is something a little bit different. This has got the two litre, which I believe is an eight valve unit. It's unusual because most of these cars went to fleet buyers and so they were looking for the benefit in kind tax deductions, they were looking for the economy and so they went for the diesel. So most of these cars you find will be a diesel. There was of course also the five cylinder and a V6 that found its way under the bonnet of these things. But the two litre is perhaps an unusual choice. It's definitely an engine choice for a personal car rather than a business car. And when we look at the spec inside, I think we'll see more of the same. The 8 valve 2 litre made 118 horsepower and 175 newton metres of torque. And performance wise that meant it would do 0 to 60 in just over 11 seconds and do 121 miles an hour. Looking around under the engine bay there is surprisingly little to actually look at. Just lots and lots of plastic. Even that's plastic. The internet manifolds are plastic. Um, so you can't really see a great deal to, uh, to talk about under here. Right, so this car is 2001. This is prime fleet car sales. So you've got big, big rivalries with things like the Vectra and the Mondeo. So they had to throw everything in this car to make it, first of all, properly loaded with kit, and secondly, a, a viable contender. So someone was gonna test drive a Mondeo and then look at the uh, Passat and say, do you know what, I think that feels better. It feels better built, better equipped. Uh, but it's gonna be practical. Someone's gonna be using this car as a living room and an office for most of their working day. So everything has to be easily to hand. So you've got nice big air vents, so you've got great through flow of air here in the center, small ones on the edges obviously, a big bank of controls. This one has got literally everything. This one is absolutely loaded. Obviously, there were 1.9 diesels that came with a lot less than this. This one is quite an exciting place to begin on the hi-fi entertainment system. This is like your old school living room stack system. We've got a radio cassette here, the Volkswagen Gamma, which I'm gonna guess from a name like Gamma is high end. Uh, underneath that, we've got the separate CD changer as a complete separate device, a single DIN item just there. And then a third DIN section here. This is the Climatronic. This is the fully loaded, I'm guessing top of the range. I'm gonna to say top of the range where there's no evidence to back it up whatsoever. External temperature, 20 degrees. I think it might even be warmer than that today. The temperature you wanna set the interior to, your ventilation controls for direction and so forth, fan speed and what have you. And of course being Climatronic, your sensors so it knows what it's gotta be doing with itself. All very clever. Then we've got a bank of six buttons potentially either side of this stuff here. I only got the rear screen heater and hazard lights on this car, curiously. So we haven't got the other options, maybe heated seats and so forth, which you could maybe have on this, but not, not today. Denied. In front of that, we have got a large metal ashtray area and a 12 volt. There's no sucker out lighter here, just a 12 volt. And that's nicely damped and a five-speed manual. I'm actually a little surprised it is a five-speed and not a six-speed at this point because you kind of think 
maybe the Mondeos will be having a six speed. It's a two litre in this car, so you know, it's a big thing that can handle a high speed sixth gear cruise. So maybe that would have been ideal. Now, because you are living in this car, living the dream on the road, uh, you've got double, double cup holders, double cup holders, in fact, triple cup holders, because you've got your two big cup holders there and a little espresso or, or smaller size drinks can holder in the center. Obviously not all at the same time. Big, 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 chunky handbrake turn activation device. And behind that, padded top. This, all the seats here are a nice velour. I do love a bit of velour, which seems to have died out in around 2001. You don't really see it anymore, but it is just fantastic stuff. Oh, you can feel the texture in this velour and feel the texture in the smoothness. And on your elbow, that just feels so, so nice. Um, the big cubby here, actually not as big as I was expecting, to be perfectly honest. Uh, half width and full width, deeper on the full width for items and gubbins and stuff. Over on the left hand side, huge uh, glove box. We're actually not that huge. Volkswagen are not that great at doing huge glove boxes. There's always some kind of intrusion in the back. And then at the back of that, we've got cooling facilities. We can have the air con blowing into there to keep your miles bars chilled. And more cup holders, excellent tea shelfery opportunities in here, but no clips for your pens or your business cards. So a bit of a fail just there, Volkswagen. Dash top itself is a large T-shelf area here. There is a ridge to prevent spillage or it will go down your air vents and then blast it back across the window. So that's not necessarily a complete win. The dial area is nice and big and clear. They've been learning from Rover in the 1990s just here. I do quite like the little silver rings they've got around each dial. You temperature, you fuel, the uh, rev counter and speedometer. This car's only got 35 and a half thousand miles on it. This clearly wasn't a rep and bill. This was someone's own personal uh, home car, which I guess is why you've not got the heated seats, but you have got tons of audio. There's a little info panel here in the centre telling us we've got one of the doors open on the side, which I wasn't aware of. Uh, we've got 60 miles of fuel and it's 21 and a half degrees centigrade. It's a very warm day today. Indicators and lights on the left. Parking lights are available on this car, not something you see too often. Wipers on the right hand side, no cruise control, which is curious. Airbag steering wheel with the, uh, the four prongs looks quite good. Very smooth, very, very, very Volkswagen indeed, this steering wheel. It, it's utilitarian and spartan in its, in its design, but does kind of look and feel good at the same time. Airbag in there and a horn. Hmm, yeah, so it's definitely a company car horn, I'm gonna call that. Uh, over to the right of that, we have got our tourney dial headlight switch, which is a common staple of Volkswagens for a long time, at least back to 2001, it would appear. Headlamp leveling and instrument brightness next to it. And over on the door, we have a few more gubbins. We've got plastic elephant hide, very, very tough door tops, metal door pull, electric mirrors, which are also heated if you flick that little thing just there. Um, Looking up at the mirrors, we do have tweeters up there, so that is to be expected with the high-end audio we have got hiding in this car. You don't expect that much audio in a Passat. Um, and we've got central locking, four electric windows, and a solid chunky door pull. Now this is very, very interesting indeed. In front of this large door pocket, which has got actually a rubber mat which lifts out for cleaning purposes, if I get my things under it, um, you've got a pull for the fuel flap and then you've got a pull for the boot lid but you can lock the boot lid from just here so if you've got valuables in there you can lock that and even if someone smashes the window and pulls that tag they're not going to be able to nick your stuff without a crowbar now these seats are extremely comfy they're not grippy and grabby like a um, exciting sports seat but you do sink into the soft soft padding oh, it's like sitting on spongebob i do quite like the little inca inscriptions on here as well which may well be a code that's telling me something i don't understand maybe someone who can speak braille can read these seats maybe it's a secret code an unlock code to do something on the dashboard buttons if you can read these seats with your eyes shut just do let me know um, lots of headroom actually tons and tons of headroom I can't barely even touch the ceiling. Um, and lots from the back as well. Let's have a quick look around the back of the car. Okay, so we've got more nice velour in the door cards, more solid elephant hide, more cast metal door pulls, electric window switch right at the top next to a little tweeter and there's a big speaker down there. We've also got seat po back pockets on both sides. An excitingly concealed James Bond-esque 12 volt socket ready to shoot stuff into the uh, rear footwell and a giant ashtray which flies out aggressively. More very, very, very soft velour braille seats telling you hidden secrets. Climb in. Oh, this is a very practical car. You can sort of see this as a taxi cab or a family car quite happily because there's a ton of room back here for your knees, ton of room for your head, 
nothing compressing your head at all. A nice big armrest just here folds down so you can either be comfortable on that or you can pull it up. You've got cup holders in there, you've got space for toys and games and whatever else. Very, very useful indeed. Very practical, very well thought out. You've even got on both sides in the back a grab handle, a coat hook and a light. So well thought out. And that boot we pulled the tag for a minute ago is absolutely cavernous. Uh, saloons can be practical if they try. This goes back a really long way. Um, I cannot even reach the end leaning in. We've got a first aid kit behind this panel on the left. We've got a 12 volt outlet here on the right. Pull the tag. We've got a full size spare wheel and we've even got little uh, extra cubby holes for stopping stuff rattling around the jack is in one of them though. This is a good space. You could be happily kidnapped in here with room to, to spare. Now the front seat is extremely adjustable. You've got raising and lowering on both front driver and passenger seats. You've got, you've got lumbar adjustment and backrest, so you can get this exactly where you want it to be. And you can raise and lower the steering wheel to find the right place. I'm gonna turn it up again, because my word, it is warm today. 26 degrees apparently, which is warmer than I like it. I know someone in Australia will now tell me that's winter's day at breakfast time. I'm not from Australia though. That's hot around here. Now something this two litre engine gets, which the uh, diesels certainly didn't, was a very high level of smoothness. This is a very, very refined feeling engine. There's none of the harshness you'd associate with a 1.9 diesel. And it feels pretty good. Pulls quite well for 175 newton meters of torque. It's not astronomical, but it's certainly enough to tow this thing along. Now we call this car the B5 Passat because that's the platform it's based on. It's the joint VW Audi Group platform that many cars are built on. Uh, the A4 actually came out on it two years before the Passat, which seems to be a fairly common thing they do in uh, the Volkswagen Group, in so much as that they will bring out the new platform MQB, for example, MQA. And uh, even though Volkswagen is kind of the parent company or so, it would appear in the name, um, Seat, Skoda, Audi will get the new car first, or the new platform to build a car on first. I don't know if that's deliberate to iron out flaws or sh shake things down. Now there were a lot of strong contenders fighting this particular market back in the 90s into the early noughties. The Mondeo obviously, the Vectra, then the Insignia, Nissan Primera, the Peugeot 406, the Renault Laguna to name but a few. It was a very fiercely fought market for those uh, company car buying pounds. And that's where you can get into the, the premium brand stuff like the Audi A4, the Mercedes C-Class, and the 3 Series, which of course ultimately ended up outselling all the run mundane stuff. In fact, the Mondeo is being canceled as we speak, and apparently it's on the cards that the Passat is not going to be renewed either. So this really is very much coming to the end of an era for these rather nice saloons. Now in terms of handling characteristics, most people generally agreed that until you got to the 3 Series, the Mondeo was the one to go for. This one always had a reputation for being extremely comfortable, well made, although there were some electrical gremlins with Volkswagen stuff around this time. They'd cut a few corners with the, um, well, the quality of the wiring as far as I can tell. So uh, when they got to uh, just out of warranty, you'd start getting a few little issues, but it's been around this long, then you've probably got past that point. But the Passat was never the one that was gonna take it to the Mondeo in the handling stakes. Uh, despite having some pretty clever suspension, it is fairly soft and not that dynamically exciting. It's got independent multi-link suspension at the front, and the front wheel drive cars have got a torsion beam rear. On the four motion cars, because four wheel drive was an option on these cars, you did then get independent rear suspension as well. Now, if you've watched this channel a long time, you'll know I had a Mark III Mondeo for a short time. And uh, something I really did enjoy about the car was just snicking through the gears. That, I think it was a six-speed gearbox on that. You could just flick through that like a, like a proper sports car. This is a little bit more rubbery and vague. It's not got the same snickety, enthusiastic feel that the Ford had. So the ride on this thing will clever suspension is fairly pliant, but it's not exciting. It doesn't make you want to fly into a corner and just see how hard you can take that bend. But it's not really about that. 
Well, this car is currently for sale at Stone Cold Classics at Rutum in Kent. If you'd like to check out this and their other stock, then hit the website in the link below. So there were many trim levels to try and find the exact Passat for your needs. There was the E, then the S, then the Sport, then the S and the E together, the SE. Then you got into the engine type names, the V5, the V6, and finally, king of them all, the Highline. Which I'm actually wondering if this is a Highline or not because it's got all the fancy radio and stuff. That big stereo, the two litre petrol engine, it does look like this was a personal purchase rather than a fleet purchase. But if you were living on the road, basically going from client to client, meeting to meeting, this would be a very comfortable way of doing it. You'd arrive relaxed. You might not be on time, but you'd be relaxed. It's a little bit like the Mercedes W124, in so much as it has a slightly heavy feeling and it's not got that brisk, rapid feeling like the Mondeo and perhaps the Vectra as well. They give you that little bit of an urge to push the car a bit faster. This doesn't really have that so much. It's very much more a feeling of safety and solidity dependability if you like. Compared to the Mondeo I had for example this does feel much better screwed together. This car has got ridiculously low miles on it. This is only about 35,000 miles from new and so there are no squeaks and rattles. Everything is as it should be. The fabric isn't baggy or worn. It does feel very much like a new car. From the driver's seat, you've got great visibility. You can see really well side to side. You've got a huge windscreen in front of you. The A-pillars are not too big. And things like these control stalks, which you will find in every Volkswagen of the, those kind of two decades, they feel pretty good as well. But it's quite nice driving a Passat like this with a petrol engine, it makes a nice change to sit in one of these that's not a diesel. In terms of practicality, these seats are very comfortable. The rear seats are nice and big. The boot is pretty huge. It's about 25 litres smaller than a Mondeo saloon for a comparison, but with the uh, rear seats folded down, it's actually a little bit larger into the back, apparently. Now overtaking, it's not the same kind of power as I was expecting. Add a little bit more speed and the car does roll more than I really expected it to. And here's where you find that diesel would probably have been the company car driver's choice because that turbo diesel oomph is slightly different in terms of delivery to the uh, the petrol car. It may be less smooth on the diesel, but that real kick in the back when you put your foot down on the dual carriageway. I'm glad I'm testing cars with air conditioning today. Yeah, the interesting feeling of this car when you drive it is everything feels very, well, damped, if that makes sense. The steering, it's not laggy or anything like that, and it does feel directly connected to the wheels. It's not like there's any play or anything at all like that. But it doesn't feel like sharply connected, like you're gonna zip around a corner. It just feels like a little bit heavy, a bit like you're pushing against rubber rather than steering sharply. Also, the gears are a little of the same, actually. They're a little kind of rubbery. The brakes are good, though. And the position of everything is really well thought out. The pedals are exactly where you want them to be. The steering wheel is just in the right place. But it's the quality of the fit and finish, the way it's all screwed together and the kind of materials they've used. You can see why Volkswagen fans absolutely love these cars. Well, thanks for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed this little look back at how motoring would be for families, well, 20 odd years ago. For, for many of you watching, this may well have been your family car back in the early noughties or late, late 90s even. I hope you've enjoyed this little glimpse of nostalgia for what is either motoring nostalgia or potentially an interesting used buy for today. If you have, please do hit like and subscribe as always, and join me again next time driving something completely different.